for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. On the show today, I've got two guests, Nicholas Zeisler, who goes by Z, and Muriel Lato. Nicholas, or Z, as we call him today on the show, is a Six Sigma black belt in process engineering, and he has been focusing on customer experience. He's on a mission to help organizations better align their customer experiences with their brand promises by learning where they're falling short and then taking decisive and deliberate action to improve how they do business to better drive brand alignment. He also served in the U.S. Air Force and Reserves for nearly 30 years and is currently a professor of statistics at the U.S. Air Force Academy, as well as a professor of the practice at Michigan State University's Eli Broad School of Business, focused on customer experience management. Marielle is a friend of mine from this club CMO. She's been named one of the world's boldest CMOs. And as a senior marketing executive and thought leader, she solves business problems through the power of marketing to deliver sustainable growth for both D2C and B2B companies. Marielle was most recently chief marketing officer at Sightline Payments, a top U.S. payments provider to the rapidly expanding online gaming, sports betting, and casino marketplace, recently valued at over $1 billion. Prior to that, she spent seven years at Western Union as the global head of brand and marketing, where she was responsible for transforming the impact of marketing across $200 million of investment. During the seven years that she was there, the digital business grew from $300 million to over $1 billion in revenue. Earlier in her career, she held senior roles for two of Europe's biggest insurance companies and also experienced working for CPG giants Unilever and Nestle. And she's worked and lived in France, Switzerland, the UK, and now resides in the US. Both Z and Marielle are in the fractional consulting business today. Z is a fractional chief customer officer and Marielle is a fractional CMO with the CMO syndicate. And on the show today, we talk about how they partner and work across, if you will, the two sides of the customer experience coin, one on operations and experience delivery, and one on understanding the brand promise and the customer experience promise that we make to our customers and how those two things interact and come together to make what we all hope to achieve, which is great customer experience. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Z and Marielle. Welcome to the show, Marielle and Z. Hey there. Hi. (laughs) Well, Marielle, maybe we start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background? Yes. First of all, I'm delighted to be here. So I'm half French, half Italian by birth and upbringing. Um, I have been in marketing for over 30 years in France, in the UK, and in the last five years in the US. And I am now a fractional interim and consulting chief marketing officer. I love it. I love it. And how about you, Z? Tell me more about yourself. Sure, Alan. My name is Z, as they call me, that's actually a remnant of the military time. I'm a reservist in the, uh, in the Air Force, but on, in the real world, I'm a fractional chief customer officer, which means that I spend the majority of my day explaining that I am not in the contact center customer care, customer service, not an account executive or part of customer success. I'm sure we'll get into the differences between that and what customer experience is. But I help my clients um, drive, drive out misalignment between what their customers are expecting and what they're actually getting. I love that. I love that. I'm a very pragmatic person myself. And Muriel and I have known each other for a number of years through CMO organizations. But how did the two of you guys meet? We were part of a networking group, met each other, hit it off immediately, mostly because of the complexity and my inability, because I am not a marketer. I used to say I don't know anything about marketing, but I spend so much time with marketers these days. But I can't exactly say that, but I am definitely not a marketer. And Muriel says, shut up, Z. Let me tell you what you do and why it's so valuable to marketers. And I said, oh, you're my best friend all day today. And there hasn't been a better day since. There's a tremendous synergy between the sort of thing that I do and the sort of thing that y'all brilliant marketers like you, Alan and Muriel, do. So we made quick friends for sure. I love that. I love that. And Muriel, what brought you to work with Z? So 
I think that from the very moment we started having a conversation around the intersection and interdependency between marketing and customer experience and what is marketing, what is customer experience, where the two intersect, why they need to intersect, I think that we found that not only did we have a lot of common ground, but we talked a lot of the same language. We had the same vision of what marketing and customer experience can deliver together. And we found that we had a good visibility of challenges from two different sides of the problem. And that in the discussions that we were having with our respective clients, there was a lot of similarities in terms of what we were facing. And we started talking about you know, what if we brought our thinking together and what if we kind of you know, tag team. We haven't yet found an opportunity to work together. But I'm sure it's just a question of time because, the, and hopefully we will get into this, the meat of this a little bit more, but the synergies and, and the interdependency between marketing and customer experience is fascinating. Yeah, no, I agree. And I do like the analogy of basically being two sides of the same coin, right? Marketing on one side, customer experience on the other side. The two have to meet, otherwise the coin is worthless. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was Z, tell me more about no, that, like how you got great. into customer experience, if you don't mind. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you stole my analogy. Oh, oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. I've been saying the similar side or the same coin, different sides of the same coin, because I have always grounded my approach towards CX in that brand promise, what I am charged with doing. And, and you ask about the origin story. I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt. I'm a process engineer, uh, industrial engineering type of a guy optimization and so forth going back years and years and years. And if, if anybody listening isn't familiar, if you think of the Bobs from Office Space, that's kind of the sort of thing <laughs> that they do. And you can imagine in that type of work can be a little soul sucking because a lot of the, the engagements begin with a client or potential client saying, hey, we're looking to cut this much amount of headcount, quite literally. Sometimes it's that stark. And I was approached by a brilliant customer-centered leader said, you know what, Z, we want to leverage that same skill set. We want to improve our processes here. But we want to improve them with the result being that our customers are going to get a better experience. And I was just blown away. That was revolutionary for me, for someone who had swum in these waters for so long, to hear somebody say, yeah, we love the idea of efficiencies. We love the idea of doing the things that we do better, saving resources and, and not being wasteful. But you know what's even better about this is we can focus that effort and we can aim those efforts at improving our customers' experiences. So for me, CX, customer experience, has always been about, and at the heart of it, improving your processes in the way that you use business. So what I'll use as a as, you know, North Star for that is a client's brand promise. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to deliver? Who are you trying to be in the market? Great. Well, that's what we're going to drive. Love that. I love that. And Marielle, picking up on the marketing side, how do you, if you will, define the relationship between that brand promise that Z is talking about and customer experience? So I've long held the belief that if you think of marketing in many instances, not the only thing that we do in marketing, but some of what we do really relates to effectively being the megaphone, amplifying, promoting, shouting from the rooftops what the company is all about, what the product is all about, how experience, how customers will experience interacting with the company, with the brand, with the product, with the employees of the organization, the distributors of the product itself or the service. So I've always been asking a lot of questions around, wait, before I design a communications campaign in its broader sense, I first really need to understand what do we do here and what is the reality of the customer experience so that there is no disconnect between what I call the brand promise and what I call the brand delivery. And the two are very, very much aligned. And in fact, when you know, Z and I started talking, we found that it is that language of brand promise and brand delivery that really kind of got us to latch onto uh, the concept of the intersection between the two and how the brand promise has to reflect, but also inspire the brand delivery, i.e. the customer experience through all the, the various touch points that a customer or a consumer will experience when they come in contact with an organization and all of the products and services that they market. Hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. I love that. I love that notion. And as you think about it, Z, 
how do you usually partner with like the marketing side of the house uh, or the CMO when you come into an organization to help improve their customer experience? Yeah, well, it has so much to do with the CMO and with the marketing organization and the efforts that are put into it. And I would just, I would just say something about what Muriel just said. I think she's selling you and her and your entire professional little short because it's not just the amplification. And I know she knows this because this is really the hard work. It's the design and the development of that brand promise in the first place. And so I think about all the work that marketing professionals and marketing executives do. And I have this picture in my head. And I think I know Muriel chuckled when I said this because she said, yeah, and Al, maybe you, you have this experience too. There you are. You're the CMO. You're sitting in the meeting with all of the rest of the ELT, right? And you're saying, you know, I put a lot of work into this brand. And I designed it and I developed, I did so much research into what the market wants. And of course, then there's the megaphone as well. And I'm doing all this. And you know what? And maybe by now your your face is in your (laughs) hand a little bit. And like, it would be a lot easier and more impactful, all this work that I and my team have done. If you assholes actually did, (laughs) did what I say to the world that we do around here. And that's where I slide in. Hey, I've got an idea. How about we actually do what you say? Sorry about the not not safe for family, but I've been in those meetings. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, that's how it happens. That's how, yeah. that's that's the language of the boardroom many yeah. times. So I find myself a- appealing often to CMOs. You know, get in front of a bunch of CMOs. Hey, has this ever happened to you? And your laughter says it all, Alan. <laughs> yes, that has. Okay, so I know this guy Z. He's an operations enterprise wide end sort of guy that will help us actually manifest and live out what it is that we've built as a brand and as a brand promise. So Muriel's point, I mean, I didn't steal her thunder like Alan, you stole mine about the two sides of the same coin because (laughs) I all credit to her. She says, Z, I'm in brand promise. You're in brand delivery. And I said, that's it. That's why we have to be best friends because that Summarize. I mean, you could tell she's obviously a marketing genius because that's exactly <laughs> what it is. I love that. I mean, and it's true. I mean, Muriel, you, you were talking about in terms of like designing the brand promise and, and making sure that brand delivery actually holds up, it's, this, holds that up and delivers on it, if you will. It's so true. I mean, we the promise itself is potentially how you're going to differentiate in the marketplace. And if you can't deliver on it, you don't have much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it, it kind of works on two, in two different ways. In the first instance, you want to make sure that whatever your current, your as-is, customer experience, brand delivery is, whatever you then end up saying as part of your brand promise is not disconnected. Otherwise, you're going to have a whole lot of disappointment. You're going to have a whole lot of negative feedback from your customers. And if they have a negative experience, they are much more likely to tell people about that negative experience than they have a positive one. So in the first instance, I think the role of marketing is to really understand what do we do today? What does the organization stand for? What do we sell? How customers experience the brand, the product, the services, and interacting with the company through all of the different touch points so that whatever we are communicating, whatever we are saying, to our customers is not an overpromise. Then the flip side of that, it's also the role of marketing to define that differentiation, to define what should the brand promise be and in an aspirational, inspirational, and future-proofing for the future growth of the organization. And then that needs to play back into the customer experience and the brand delivery function or functions, because it's more than one very often. And drive a journey of improvement, drive a kind of bettering of the processes, of the values, of the behaviors. So there needs to be this constant iteration between brand promise and brand delivery so that the two parties can come together and are constantly challenging each other in making sure that what we say and what we do are aligned and that we are constantly looking for ways of moving forward, improving that, and that eventually drives growth. If I could just piggyback on that, Alan, just for just a second, when Muriel talks about that alignment, how important it is, because you could be, your organization, your company, your brand could be the best at delivering, pick any brand promise you want. We're the ease of use brand. We're the absolute, you know, ease of use. That's our brand promise. That's what we want to deliver. But if what you're saying, if what you're marketing is, is that you're the high tech solution, right? So you're bleeding edge. We've got the greatest, newest thing. 
Well, that's great that you're delivering on a brand promise, but you're not delivering on the brand promise that you're intending and that you're forecasting and that you're broadcasting to the world. Well, there's that misalignment. So even if you're great at something, it's got to line up with what it is that you're telling the world you're all about. And that can also be that synergistic kind of cycle where where we're talking to each other as well. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Maybe talk about a few examples. Muriel, do you you have any thoughts or examples in your mind and in terms of like where marketing and CX have partnered well, what it looks like? Yeah. So a few years ago, I was working for a large international private medical insurance company, and we were present in 192 countries. And what we provided was really a very, very niche, very, very unique product, which was international private medical insurance. So if you think about it, if you are an expat living particularly in a country where maybe the medical infrastructure is not as well developed as it could be, so let's say, you know, parts of Africa, parts of Asia, parts of Latin America, not only do you want to get access to the best possible care in the country, in the city where you're living, you probably also want to be able to go to a neighboring country, maybe where the medical infrastructure is a little bit more developed, or you want to be able to come back to your home country where your family is going to be able to support you, particularly if your um, need for treatment is something you know, a little bit more advanced, a little bit more specific, or a little bit more longer term. So the product we were selling at that point in time was a international private medical insurance policy, which allowed you to effectively seek medical treatment in multiple countries in any given period of time. And what we were finding is that we were constantly being pushed down on price. And we were constantly being driven to say, but how can we choose the cost of an insurance policy? How can we drive down efficiencies? And this was not a very strong differentiating factor. There were other competitors in the marketplace that were cheaper than we were. We offered very much a white glove service where, for example, if something happened to you in China, we would actually get you um, fast-tracked through a VIP process. So that, you know, you didn't have to queue for eight hours in the emergency room. You know, you would get to see a doctor immediately. And we had that service. It just wasn't reflected in the communication that we were making. And we didn't have it everywhere in the world. It was very patchy. So I ended up sitting down with the rest of the executive team and really talking through a very, very structured, rigorous framework where we would need to identify the brand promise and the brand delivery and how the two of them would be consistently delivering everywhere you went. Because the definition of an international private medical insurance policy is that you get the same level of treatment from us, the insurance company, and from the medical treatment facilities, the doctors, the hospitals, and everywhere else, wherever you are in the world. So this was an entire leadership team effort where everybody had to rally around, commit resource, and really go through with a fine tooth comb what are all the touch points that a customer will experience, not just with us, but also with the primary or um, hospital care providers to make sure that everything was aligned. And we ended up completely redefining our customer experience journey and completely redefining our marketing approach to this so that the two of them will come together. And that allowed us to have the fastest growth that we had ever had as an organization. And the business had been around for over 40 years. And the year that we did that and the following two years, we saw the biggest growth we'd ever had. And almost the conversation around price went away because what we ended up standing for was not we are the cheapest, but we are the best. I love that example. I love that example. For many reasons, I mean, one, just the nature of how it came together and the impact that you had, but also the notion that like what you were delivering was a service that's hard to know what it's like until you experience it. I think many times the customer experience delivery bleeds into actual like service design and and product design, if you will, like quote unquote products. But Z, I'm curious if you have any examples, either good or bad, that you want to share as well. Yeah, I love that one because it's got a couple of things, aspects of of what I love in a story about business. And one is listening and taking in what your customers are telling you. But it's also about not being so doctrinal about exactly, like you don't have the answer to everything. You maybe think that you've got it figured out, but you've got to be flexible. And I'd kind of 
made a joke earlier about CX is not contact center. But one of the things that I like to say as kind of a tongue in cheek thing is that if people are looking for good voice of the customer systems or, or technology or whatever, I got to answer the voice of the customer. You know, we're not getting enough of a, a survey response or something like that. I said, you could throw your entire VOC program in the trash and just walk down to the contact center and just ask them, what are you getting calls on all day? Right. Talk to your customer success team whose job, unfortunately, often is as Sherpa <laughs> through your completely disastrous Byzantine processes. You know, your labyrinthic get the product or the service to your customer is such a pain in the neck that your customer success team, who's supposed to be helping your clients and customers find the optimal use of your product or your service, are instead just trying to get the product to them and follow through all the simple or, or follow through all the ridiculously uh, complicated steps. Say I had a client currently who is trying to make more of a deliberate evolution from that customer support and customer care function. Frankly, it's a customer care organization that is, the thing about CX is it has a broad parentage. You know, I talked about how I came in it from the process engineering side. But a lot of times, and it's, it's not so apocryphal, but it's hard to find an exact example of how the customer experience organization was birthed when somebody from the contact center got tired of taking the same damn phone call every day, all day, <laughs> marched down to product or engineering or something like that and said, you've got to fix this because we're tired of fixing it on the back end. So that sort of thing happens, but it isn't often that it's done deliberately. So I have a client right now who's trying to make that actually happen and evolve from a contact center into a customer experience center of expertise that helps the entire enterprise improve and change the way that they do things on purpose, not just because somebody finally gets pissed off enough that they, that they sound the alarm. It's like, no, 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 you're going to take from us insights into how our customers are interacting with the brand. We're going to analyze that together, sure, as a team. And then we're going to, and they don't yet have this, but then we're going to unleash the resources in process engineering that we have here and help you actually move the needle on that. And we're going to become the center of that. And it's, you know, there's, there's the evolution of contact center being, being the cost sink into the revenue center, right? But this is something that adds an even better aspect, an even better bonus to the organization. It's like, this is an insights organization, and this is a change driver within our company. I love the example as well. And this is really something, I mean, that can sort of unify the company uh, to some degree if, if you do it right. Yeah, yeah, it's taking that CX is everybody's job BS line that doesn't really mean anything into actually, no, here's what CX means to you and should mean to you. And what a great way to elevate the contact center in your example to, to something that's more strategic and not just the problem solver on the back end to your point. And can I just, I just want to add something. So in that example with this international private insurance company, actually the call center became a source of insight. We actually did exactly what you've just talked about, Z, which is, you know, we would turn to them and say, hey, what are you hearing? You know, where, because what we were trying to identify is what are customers calling us for, both positive and negative? What are they inquiring about? And how can we extract from that any insights where there may be a disconnect between our brand promise and our brand delivery? And then the question becomes, do we need to tweak our brand promise or do we need to tweak our brand delivery or both? Mm -hmm. So they were an absolutely critical part of helping us design both the brand promise and the brand delivery and make sure that the two of them walked hand in hand and were completely in sync. And in that fact, it became a discipline within the leadership team that we would effectively do call listening on a weekly basis. Now, sometimes we couldn't go do call listening live, but all the calls were recorded and they were readily accessible to everybody, not only in the leadership team, but my entire team in marketing was listening to customer calls. Sometimes we would do this for a couple of hours together and then we would sit down and reflect and say, what have you heard? What are the themes? What are the insights? What are we going to do about it? Do we need to do anything about it? How do we use this to inform both the brand promise and the brand delivery? And how do we build a outstanding differentiator for the organization that can support growth going forward from that interaction, that insights, that knowledge that we can pull from the core centers? 
You know, Muriel, there is that story about Jeff Bezos dialing up Amazon's customer care in in the leadership call, like in the meeting. Like whoever is at who was the head of contact center at Amazon or whatever at the in the, in the day, who hopefully by now is working somewhere else. But anyway, <laughs> He said, oh, yeah, our hold times are whatever. And so Bezos dials the number right in front of everybody right there and sits on hold for much longer than things. But Muriel, a lot of that call listening stuff and a lot of brands and a lot of organizations, they do that so they can beat up on the contact center. Well, there wasn't enough empathy in this, in this agent or the hold time was too long or I didn't really get the solution that I needed. It's like, yeah, that's great. But you know what you really should be listening to is what's wrong operationally within your organization? Yeah, should your contact center be listening to calls so that they can improve their own operations and, and, and all of those things that, that go into a great contact center operation? Absolutely, 100%. But the whole company needs to be looking at JIRA and finding out why people are calling at all in the first place. Pareto analysis that and fix the biggest bar on that chart. I love that. I love that. And it's no... No surprise that you guys have found each other. I mean, I'm glad you found each other because you definitely are illustrative of the two-sided coin we were just talking about. You're talking about the same exact things. I love it. I love it. Well, Z, I know you've written a book on this topic. Can you tell us a little bit more about you know the motivation and the process to write a book? Yeah, I'm an intrinsically lazy person and I hate sales. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to have to go out and pitch and explain what my process and what my system and what my framework is over and over again. So I just wrote a book about it. And it's called We're Doing CX Wrong and How to Get It Right. And you can't see, but I'm holding it up to my camera that's not on. And I wrote it more or less to explain what my framework was. And that took about eight pages. And so I figured, you know what, I think I'm going to put this more in the frame of how people use things like voice of the cut, like, like Muriel and I were just talking about people use voice of the customer wrong. And it's because they're not strategically looking at why are you asking the questions that you're asking? Are you asking the questions because you need to know what your NPS or your CSAT number or whatever it is so that you can put another dot on your line chart? Or are you asking because what you want to do is improve the way that you're doing what you do? And then it moves on into the rest of the framework, which is, hey, what are we doing with it? <laughs> it's, it's that cycle. It changes what you ask when you have a reason for asking it in the first place. And the reason for asking in the first place is because you intend on taking action, which is that process engineering. And then we'll also talk a little bit in there about what it means to have a CX-centric culture in an organization, how we, we need to enable, empower, and encourage all of the people that work in our organizations, enable with the right tools and the right access to those tools that they need in order to deliver that brand promise, as well as enabling them so everything isn't an escalation so that I have the authority to actually do the things that will deliver on that brand promise. And encouragement are things, yeah, sure, banners, we heart to the customer. Here's a mouse pad that says that we love the customer, but it's also walking the talk. And when people see the leadership in an organization dedicating themselves to improving the things that they do, that speaks so much louder than anything that, that you're saying. I love that. I love those takeaways. Muriel, I'm curious, what do you think it takes to bring people together around this whole concept of merging your brand promise and brand delivery and the CX all together? So the first place for me is back to something that Z just mentioned, which is this is not just a tick on the dashboard. In actual fact, I think the whole culture of wanting to have green dots on your dashboard that indicates everything is going smoothly, I think is actually the antithesis of progress, is the antithesis of improvement. You need to be looking for the red dots because the red dots is usually indicative of a problem of some sort. Now, the important question is, why is there a problem? Is it a temporary issue? Is it a permanent issue? Is it a structural issue? Is it a behavioral issue? Is it a capability issue? Is it a promise versus delivery issue? So the why do we have a green dot? Sorry, why do we have a red dot is really the question that we need to be drilling into. And I used to love it. And I used to be probably the only one around the leadership table that I loved red dots on the report. And that was where my focus was. So whilst everybody was celebrating and patting each other on the back on a set of red, a set of green dots, my message was always, well, if the dot is green, does that mean we're doing enough? Does that mean we are progressing? Does that mean that we are keeping up with our competitors? Or are we just lulling ourselves into a full sense of security just because we've got green dots doesn't mean everything is okay. And you need to unpack this a little bit more and you need to identify 
is the green dot really green? Or is there some red in there that we need to be drilling into? And for me, the red dots was where my focus always was as a leader around the leadership table. And it really needs to come from the top. I think that it's much easier to align a small group of people and lead by example for the rest of their individual organizations when those leaders come together to problem solve together around something that matters. It matters to the leadership team. It matters to the customers. It matters to the shareholders. It matters to everybody who touches the organization or the employees, their motivation. Because ultimately, everybody wants to do something good, to feel valued, and to feel that we are bringing value to the customers. So for me, that honing in on where are the issues and not, as Z mentioned, to beat each other up over that, but to really truly understand why are we having an issue and what are we going to do about it? And that can really be a rallying cry for the leadership team to come together and really ask the right questions, which are not, is this metric the right metric or is the green dot or a red dot the right thing to look at, but much more what's underneath it? What does that tell us about the health of our organization? What does that tell us about the inherent problems that we need to be solving so that we can continue moving forward and we can continue to grow versus our competitors and for the benefit of our customers and our employees and shareholders and investors and everybody else around us? I love all of that. And and I think you've now shifted my perspective to focus on red dots now, too. <laughs> I, I never thought about them as lovely things to dig into until now. So yeah. I, I, I love me a red dot. Thank you very much. <laughs> do, do you know what? Alan, I got to tell you, one of the things that surprises me is hanging out in the circles of other quote unquote CX professionals. One of the things that I'll see often is how do you deal with negative feedback? And I'm like, I don't think I understand the question. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean, how do I deal with it? That's what I'm searching for. <laughs> what am I going to improve if I can't find any negative feedback? I love that. I love that. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I mean, I've, I've, I've learned a lot already. Uh, I've pivoted my thinking. Green is not so good anymore. <laughs> we like to get to know the folks that come on the show a little bit better. And I thought there's one question I could ask both of you. Maybe I'll start with, Muriel, what advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this whole life journey, career journey all over again? So for me, the, my biggest insight into myself and my biggest learning experience as a leader has really been to try and not be perfect at everything. I think I was raised, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, I'm a, I was raised to believe that as a leader and as I progressed in my leadership journey, I needed to be great at everything. And I had a mentor oh, probably 10, 15 years ago who sat me down and said, you know, the danger with trying to be great at everything is that you end up being a little bit average across the board. <laughs> and I tell you, that kind of really got me riled up because I don't want to be average. Who wants, who gets up in the morning and says, I just want to be average today. So the big conversation that I had with him and where I think his mentorship really, really helped me understand how I can define myself as a leader was to really pick two, three, five things maybe where I can be excellent at and really hone my craft and really hone both my behavior and my skills to really be excellent at three to five things, but also to recognize where I'm just going to be maybe okay or maybe a little bit less than okay on some of them. And then recruit people around me or partner, because it doesn't always have to be through recruitment, but partner with other people that, that can complement me. And that, that, that really shifted my leadership style from, you know, this kind of like command and control where I'm the boss, I need to know everything, I need to have the answers to everything, to being a much more collaborative in a collective type of approach where everybody brings their best self to the table. And together, we problem solve in ways that I cannot do alone. And for me, that's kind of really the message that I now give people that I coach and the, the, um, something that I wish I'd known much earlier in my career because I think I would have progressed faster and further if I'd been able to understand the difference between being 
okay across many, many different things versus being excellent at three, four, five things. I love it. I love it. Well, Z, how about you? What advice would you give your younger self? My younger self, I would say, there's this lady named Muriel and you need to meet her now. <laughs> Rather than wait. No, I've been panicking since you asked her that because I'd tell my younger self, here's a question you're going to get years from now. Start thinking now how you would answer. (laughs) And this is going to sound like it contradicts what Muriel just said, but actually it's quite complimentary of that. And it's the same sort of advice that I give. I'd mentioned earlier that I have a military background. I'm still a, a reservist after a million years. And in my reserve capacity, I'm a professor at the Air Force Academy. And I often get the question from the cadets, hey, what do you recommend? What are, you know, what's your career advice? And of course, tongue in cheek, it's always, look, ask the jet fighter pilots who are your other professors. Don't ask me because that's more likely, you know, where you'll end up. But one thing for sure that I noticed, and it took a little bit longer for me to appreciate this because there's a lot of fear involved with, with being young. There's a lot of careless disregard as well. <laughs> but when it comes to your professional career, Every time anybody comes to you with an opportunity to try something new, you should take it because nobody has the time, the resources, or is doing so well that they can afford for you to look stupid and do something poorly, knowing that you're not good at it, you know, just to get a laugh at your expense. If somebody comes up to you and says, I want to give you a chance to do this, jump on it every time because that shows that they have the faith in you. It's not going to be easy, especially if you're not sure you can do it, but you'll figure it out and you'll get along and you will learn and you will grow, which again, I'm not saying be perfect (laughs) 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 to Muriel's point here, but every instance that I've gotten new experiences and gotten a broader perspective from having taken the opportunity that somebody has laid before me, I have never regretted that. The only thing that I close, come close to regretting is not having done more of it when I was younger because there were other opportunities when someone said, Z, you should try this. Z, let's give this a shot. And I said, no, 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 I don't know how to do that. I'm not going to do that. You've got to lose that fear and you've got to take advantage of opportunities as they come along. And once I figure that out, it's been excellent ever since. <laughs> I love both of your advice. So good that they complement each other all in the end as well. I mean, you guys are a natural partnership here. Well, I just want to say thank you both for coming on the show. It's been fascinating, and I hope we can have a conversation again in the future. Likewise, sure. Thank you. That's been awesome. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. 